Hi, I'm Gail Rubin. Get ready for today's episode of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Welcome to today's show brought to you by the fine folks at French Funerals and Cremations. As the doyen of death, check out the pearls, I'm all about getting the funeral planning conversation started. A doyen is a woman who's considered senior in a group who knows a lot about a particular subject. And that would be me when it comes to the party no one wants to plan a funeral or memorial service. By thinking about what you'd want in your funeral and having that conversation before there's a death or illness, you can reduce stress at a time of grief, minimize family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. And that's what this program is all about. Just as talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead, and your family will benefit from the conversation. So let's get the conversation started. Our guest today to discuss estate planning issues is Jim Plitz, an attorney with the law firm of Morris, Hall, and Kinghorn. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Gail. Glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here. So who needs to do estate planning? Well, pretty much everybody. Uh, you need to think about what is in your estate and what you want to have happen with it. What is an estate? Let's back up and define that. How about that? That's <laughs> An estate is everything, everything you own. So it's your real property, your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts, your retirement plan, your jewelry, your art, your personal property. <laughs> it's all your stuff. And the one thing that people don't remember is that their life insurance is also part of their estate. Oh. Yeah, it's one of those things that kind of fall to the side when we're talking about taxes and planning for your estate that is it is an includable asset well that's right because it's not something that you have when you're alive it's something that's paid to your family upon after death you, after you're dead so yes that would be something one needs to consider well what happens if you have assets uh, your stuff and you die and you have no will in place if you have no will the good state plans your estate for you Whoa! Yeah, it's a Government, scary proposition. Government, stay away from my stuff. Yeah, they, <laughs> here in New Mexico, they will plan who makes your financial decisions, who makes your medical decisions, and then ultimately where you, does your stuff go. Now, is, I, I know there's a su succession of who does that. A spouse is first? Yeah, typically your spouse is first and then siblings or then children, then siblings on, on down the line. There is a hierarchy, mm -hmm. but in today's, today's world, with multiple mixed marriages, it's not as clear cut as 20, 30, 40 years ago where the nuclear family was really nuclear. Yeah, yeah. And, and plus we have families of choice. People are not necessarily blood relatives, but you would want you know, that person in your life to get your stuff. Right. With, with proper estate planning, it's about picking who you want to make decisions and not relying on a blood relationship, but actually a familiar Somebody relationship. Somebody who knows you and loves you and Correct. speak well on your behalf. Right. Um, so we hear a lot about probate. And a lot of people want to avoid probate. So what is probate and why do we want to avoid it? Probate is a way, the mechanism the state has in place to get assets from the dead to the living. Probate is a public court proceeding. So everything that's said in open court becomes public record. So number one, we want to avoid court proceedings because they're public record. The number one growing crime in America is identity theft. 
So if I have to stand up in open court and say I have $500,000 and I'm a grieving widower, I'm now vulnerable oh. to these identity thieves. Well, how would an identity, the identity that thief get that information in open court? I mean, do they just sit there in open court and take notes? That's one option, but uh -huh. all the court proceedings are recorded, and so it's in the court records. So you just go into the court records and pull up probate cases, and you could sift through and see what was in the estate, who's getting it, is it a widower, or is it going down to children, uh -huh. multiple children. So it's a privacy issue for one thing. One thing's a privacy issue. Mm -hmm. Another thing is a time issue. It's about 18 to 24 months to get through a probate proceeding. That's a lot of time where you don't have access as the beneficiary to your loved one's estate to help you out as that gift was intended. Mm -hmm. And finally, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Attorneys are expensive. <laughs> Court costs are expensive. Yes. And as you add up time, 18, 24 months, the average here in Bernalillo County is 5.5% of your total worth. So a million dollar estate a probate could cost upward of $55,000. Wow. wow. So what do you do to avoid probate? There are a couple techniques you could do. One, you could spend it all. If you don't have an <laughs> estate to plan. It's a rainy day. Let's it's spend gone. our money. Right. <laughs> Though that's not a viable option since we don't know when we're going to die. So we might fall short a little and end up with an estate anyway. The other way is uh, rely on the state's plan. Go, go, go through intestacy. It, it, it's a plan, though I wouldn't recommend it because it might not meet your particular goals. You could do joint tenancy. That avoids probate. Mm -hmm. But Ex Explain what joint tenancy is. Okay, joint tenancy is when two people, if we were married, we might own our home in joint tenancy. Mm -hmm. When I pass away, you automatically own 100% of the home. The problem with that is when we're a married couple, there's two deaths that we have to deal with. So we avoided probate on the first death, uh -huh. but not the second death. And what happens after the second death? Now we have a probate. Oh, <laughs> so we're back okay. in court. Uh, back to court. Yeah. <laughs> and you could try to avoid it by doing a joint tenancy with your children, but joint tenancy means 100% ownership. If you try to sell your home that you're joint tenants with your children, the kids have to agree to that. And they might not agree because that's a family home. Mm -hmm. They might want it ultimately. So there's a lot of issues with joint tenancy. The cleanest way to avoid probate is with a living trust. You essentially title your estate, your assets, into a trust name because a trust doesn't die. It continues to live on beyond your death. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about how that would work. How do you set up a trust? Well, setting up a trust is working with an attorney to understand your particular needs, your goals, and what's in your estate. Not all trusts are created equal, and we want to understand what needs you have to achieve your goals. So working with a qualified attorney to draft the document that meets your goals is step one. Step two is a critical step. If you don't title your assets into the trust name, the trust is as good as a piece of paper. Uh -huh. So when you look at your bank statement, you shouldn't see Gail Rubin anymore. You should see it, the Rubin Living Trust. Oh, okay. So you don't own your asset. The trust does. You just control the trust. But you still have access to your money and all that other stuff. 100% percent access, right. <laughs> okay. You don't legally own it, but for all practical perspective, intent, you spend your money like you always did, you invest like you always have, you do whatever you want. You could buy new art, new jewelry, go on that world tour, whatever you want. It's your money. It's just legally titled into the trust. Okay, and then when you die, who takes care of managing the trust? You have set up the trust in a way to name successors. So the, the role is called trustee. While you're alive, you are your own trustee. Mm -hmm. On your death, you've named successors, people you trust who you know will take care of your financial affairs for you. 
So on your death, there's a natural transition to the new person who's in charge of everything. Now they're in charge and they have to distribute it per the trust terms. If we're a married couple, it's going to be distributed obviously to the surviving spouse. If we're talking to the children or your other loved ones, then the distributions will be made to them according to the trustors, the makers of the trust's wishes. And what their wishes are. Okay. okay. Well, we're going to take a short break here. And when we return, we will speak further with attorney Jim Flitz on estate planning issues. How can you eat like that? Relax, dude. I'm freaking dead. It's one of the perks. I can eat whatever the hell I want. How do I get in on this? What, the whole death thing? Yeah. First off, I mean, look at what you're eating. No wonder you've lived this long. Feed this to the village cow, all right? Bring him a glass of your finest expired milk. Oh, before you go checking out, do you have a will? Any funeral arrangements, plans like that? Did you? No, and because of that, now my family's in turmoil. They're fighting, bickering over money. Now they're dead broke. Do some real planning, okay? Before you figure out your exit strategy. See, everybody's doing it. I can't wait to get started. I've never seen anybody dying to die like you. Good luck, kid. Welcome back. We're speaking with attorney Jim Blitz with the law firm of Morris Hall and Kinghorn. Let's continue the conversation about estate planning issues. So when you say estate planning, does that mean you have to be a millionaire? That's a common misconception. Yeah, millionaires need estate planning. They need advanced estate planning because they have a lot of more issues to deal with. But if your estate is $100,000 as a married couple, you should have an estate plan. Now remember, everything that's in the estate to get to that $100,000 mark, it's, it's easier than you think. Your house. Your house, your bank accounts, mm -hmm. your life insurance. Remember, your life insurance is included there. You're so, assuming people have life insurance. Not everybody does, but if they're smart, they will. <laughs> the, other, the other factor with getting uh, a, a trust, you have the financial aspect, but you have the family aspect. If, is there someone you care about? Is there someone you love? Well, if you, want, if you love them, you're going to want to make it easier for them on the transition, either on your death or incapacity, and the trust could be there to help that transition seamlessly. Well, that word incapacity, that's in a very important distinction. You can still be around, but you're mentally not present, either um, through mental you know, Alzheimer's or uh, perhaps you go into a coma and you're still alive. So let's talk a little bit, do you handle advanced directives and living wills and those kind of yeah. issues? When, when you're doing proper estate planning, the trust is a centerpiece for your finances, for your assets, but you need to make sure you have a health care power of attorney, living will, advanced directive, and authorization to disclose under the HIPAA laws, who could talk to the doctors. A complete estate plan ensures that not only your financial decisions are lined up, but your health decisions are lined up because, like you said, people don't just go from 100% healthy to dead. <laughs> There's a there point in illness, typically, in between yeah. Yeah. Uh, that we need to plan for that everyone should be planning for. And it's so important to, uh, and we are going to be talking about advanced directives in another episode in more detail, but to have your wishes if you want to be kept alive as long as possible or do you want just pain relief and you know let me go and when the time is right exactly and i mean the 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 impotence of all these advanced directives is a terry shivo case out of florida mm -hmm. where husband and parents disagreed on what terry's wishes were she didn't have any documentation, so they spent literally millions of dollars in court costs to ultimately determine that the husband was the decision maker. Uh -huh. Had she simply filled out an advance directive, her wishes are known 
and it's an easy decision moving forward. And, and that's something people can do on their own, can't they? Yes, yeah, you, you could always just write down your wishes. Uh, you should use statutory forms, so it's always good to get advice from an attorney mm -hmm. to make sure that the form you have in place actually conforms with the statutes. Mm -hmm. The worst case possible is, is you have a document in place, you go to use it, or your family goes to use it, and it's not accepted. Oh. Well, so when is a good time to do this paperwork, to set up directives and trusts and, and all these good things? So if you're an adult, so 18 years old or older, so if you're 18 or 118, you need a health care directive. You need the health care power of attorney, HIPAA. You should have a property power of attorney because you want to make decisions. Who can make decisions for you financially, even if you don't have a lot of stuff? Uh -huh. So everyone needs at least those four documents. Now, as your estate grows, maybe a will is all you need. So you have who's making decisions at your death. At the $100,000 mark, or if you have a complicated family, second marriages, multiple children from different marriages, different people, a trust now plays a role. So you want to take that into consideration when you're factoring. You should start planning earlier because then you have more flexibility for your plan to grow as you grow, as your estate grows. Don't wait to the last minute because unfortunately we don't know when we that don't last know minute when that is. last minute will be, unfortunately. Right. And that's yeah. I think why a lot of people get nervous about the whole thing. And the point about keeping up to date with these papers. I have to admit, I got married a, a number of years ago, and I have not revisited my will with my husband. How often should one take a, a look at those papers and revisit what you've set up? At our firm, we want our clients to come back every three years. Every three years. Okay. Just We want to make sure the plan you put in place still works for you. We, As attorneys, we'll let you know what the law changes are but we're not going to know your life changes. Mm -hmm. You have to let us know. And if we put a three-year calendar, it gives us time to make changes, to update. And obviously, if something major happens ahead of that, yeah, come in and see us talk. But every three years is enough time to... Things have changed maybe a little, and mm -hmm. you can make educated decisions whether more changes are needed in the actual plan. Because you can inherit money from your parents, perhaps, so you've got more money in your estate or in your stuff. Uh, you might have children. You might have other deaths that you know contribute. The matchings, hatchings, and dispatchings of our lives. Yeah. Well, what should people do at a minimum to put their affairs in order? They really need to think about what they have. Get organized. Understand. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm a newly red. I might not have much, but I do have a newborn. So I need to have at least a will so I could nominate guardians if something happened to me and my wife for my minor child. But if you understand what you have, family and assets, it will start the conversation going. Once you have an understanding of what you have, then talk to a qualified attorney to see what plan works best for you. Because not every plan is equal, and not everybody needs a Bill Gates level plan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about single people? Single people need, need plans too, because with a married couple, there's a natural decision maker built in. Your spouse should be your primary decision maker in most cases. Mm -hmm. With a single person, there's no natural person to make decisions for you, health or financial. You could rely on your parents, but they could be across the country. They're also aging, so they might not be readily available for whatever reason to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And they might not actually know who you are today as best your best friend does. So if you have a plan in place, you get to decide, you control who's making decisions for you. And. Um same-sex couples, they've got special challenges with their stuff, their estates as well. Critical for same-sex couples because the laws, the statutes, the courts, courts 
don't recognize same-sex marriage, so they're not treated equally, so you need to have documentation to say where your stuff, your assets go. If you don't have a plan in place in a same-sex couple, it will go to your kids or your parents, not to your loved one. Right, and so that kind of paperwork helps definitely direct your assets to the people you want them to go to. Correct, if you have a trust in place, it's a private document, so the courts aren't involved, the statutes aren't involved, it's how you want your estate, your assets, to be directed either on your incapacity or on your death. Okay. Now, in one's person's personal affairs, any suggestions for getting the, your stuff together so that if there's a surprise death, you know, it, people will not be scrambling to find everything? Right. Getting organized is critical. Uh, you, you need to have your files in order, what assets, what bank accounts do you have? You need to get rid of all those old ones. We have clients that have life insurance policies that lapsed 5, 10, 15 years ago, but they still have it. That only serves to confuse the people who are trying to help you. It, get rid of the old documents. Shred them. Get rid of them. What do you have today? It doesn't really matter what you had yesterday. Okay. Any other tips on being organized? And it's it's more than organization and getting your file, files in order. It's communicating where those files are. Oh, absolutely. So it's talking yeah. with your successor trustee or your loved ones, your kids, so they understand that. Yeah, all my important records are in the safe deposit box or in the file drawer or under the bed. They know where to find the important papers. So you've organized them, trimmed them down to the necessities, but they know where to look immediately. Can you provide a, a, shor a short story about a family that you were able to help that maybe had a particular issue that um, estate planning really helped? Yeah, it happens all the time, and it's one of the reasons I got into estate planning because it is the ability to help people. Uh, we have families come in, typically the children, parents have passed away, and they need to move forward with paying funeral costs and paying final expenses. Had they not had a trust in place, they don't have access to the funds, so they're either paying out of pocket which in many cases they don't have, or they're delaying the final viewings, the final funeral. So having the trust in place gave the kids, the families, the ability to move forward with the grieving process and the finality of the death and be able to have access to the funds to be able to do that. Is, is that contingent on basically getting the death certificate from the funeral home? Pretty much, that's, that's the catalyst. Once you have uh, the death certificate, that triggers the events, and we're not waiting 18, 24 months to get access. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a much cleaner, quicker process to have a successor trustee come in then go through the probate process. And would the trustee be somebody local to a family? It, it depends. You know, yeah. technology makes it easier. I have clients in South Carolina, in Colorado, in Washington that still use us because I'm able to communicate with telephone, email, Skype. Yeah. So, yeah, it's better generally to have your support here local. Locally. Yeah. But it, it, it's not uncommon to be cross-country. We have an amazing technological world of uh, resources at our fingertips. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Jim Plitz. He's a, with the premier estate planning firm of Morris Hall and Kinghorn. And a big thank you to the French family of companies for supporting this program. Join us next week as we discuss other uh, management issues and uh, after there's a death in the family. Don't forget you can find more information about this topic and many others at my website at goodgoodbye.com. And remember, talking about sex won't make you pregnant.
Talking about funerals won't make you dead. Start a conversation today. Proper estate planning enables you to pass your possessions and your assets to the people and organizations that you care about. By planning with a living trust, you could avoid the high cost of probate and minimize taxation. The attorneys at Morris Hall have been helping thousands of clients pass their assets as they intended. To schedule your free consultation, call us at 505-889-0100 or visit us at morristrust.com. A good goodbye, funeral planning for those who don't plan to die, is a light touch on a serious subject. The book has everything you need to know before you go. A good goodbye helps you reduce stress and family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. It's available in paperback and all ebook formats through online retailers and at agoodgoodbye.com. Start a conversation today. Mom, have you thought about whether you want to be buried or cremated when you know? Oh, don't make a fuss over me. Just stick me out there between Floppy and Mr. Meow. Crown molding throughout the kitchen and wait until you see this son of a... Are you kidding me, man? You don't live here anymore. I'm just trying to be a good son. I don't care. Get out of the yard. No, get, get out of the yard. You can't avoid your funeral. Pre-plan and take the burden off someone else. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die, and creator of The Newly Dead Game. The Newly Dead Game is like the classic TV show, The Newly Wed Game, but the questions test how well you know someone else's last wishes. It's a fun way to get the funeral planning conversation started. For more information about The Newly Dead Game, visit agoodgoodbye.com.